everyone. Welcome to the We'll See You in Hell podcast, now a part of the Fangoria Podcast Network. For more information about the network, including other programs, how to follow the show, and find past episodes of We'll See You in Hell, please visit Fangoria.com. Now on with the show, and on with the Joe. Hi, Pat. How are you? <laughs> People like are liking that. They do. Uh, you know, the numbers have spoken. Um, I actually heard uh, more people like that than uh, liked Peyton Manning when he uh, won the Super Bowl. Really? Yeah. Well, that's amazing. We, my, that means we were trending. It's my Trump impression. Oh, really? You hear that? No. What did he say about Peyton Manning, though? They asked him uh, how he thought he did at the CIA. They were like, why are you talking about your crowd size? This is a meeting, your first meeting with the CIA. <laughs> and he goes, uh, you know, uh, the fake news, they're trying to... Yeah, I'm going to do a little impression work. Right. The fake news, you know, they're, they're trying to pretend I didn't do good in that uh, in that speech. I did so well. Uh, I I was told, many people told me that I had the biggest standing ovation since Peyton Manning won the Super Bowl. <laughs> in, a, in a room of 100 people. It's, it's one of the craziest things I've ever heard. Many people, I, many people <laughs> told him no one's had a standing ovation that long since Peyton Manning. And you, that's how you answer a question. Day two as a president of the United States. I, it, it's, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if he's out of his mind. He is. You do know. Or if, or if they're saying, here's how we smoke screen him. You go out there. You say this crazy shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, then I know Bannon's playing him. Like we'll a, be doing like all this back piccolo. here. Piccolo. I don't know what the hell is going on. Like a two bit piccolo, folks. Uh, uh, that's our that's our politics chat. I did want to say. And I know we've already had people tell us they don't want us to talk politics. We'll get right past it, but it's a terrible time. It's a terrible time. The old Muslim ban kicked in yesterday to give you an idea time-wise of where we're at. But, uh, uh, Joe, the previous time we talked politics, which I thought was a great conversation. Yeah. You had said, you know, and of course we all know things got way worse than we expected way quicker. But you were like... You know, it's going to be like it always was. You know, like we've had Bush and everybody said the sky was falling. We had Obama. Everybody said the sky was falling. I mean. Uh, I was wrong. You were like, I bet my life's not going to change that much. <laughs> and I almost got into that deeper with you. But I was like, what I know Joe doesn't mean by that and would probably like to clarify in case anybody listens to the old ones. And you do because we get your comments. Is that I don't think and correct me if I'm wrong, Joe. Sure. I don't think that you meant. It doesn't affect me, so I don't care. Because now you can see that while it might not affect you and I, a couple of reasonably successful white males in our 30s. I'm not technically white. I always have to point (laughs) that out. All right. I I just feel like you you must care about the the everyone else who's going to be Of course I do. That's not what I meant at all. Things got terrible real fast. And I knew you'd want to clarify. What I meant was... uh, would I, by the way, Pat didn't set me up for that at all. I didn't say, hey, let's go on and pretend like I need to clarify no. something. No, not at all. I didn't even know you were going to say that. But that, now that you said I like, it. Uh, I, I look, I learned from David Frost, you know, the star of Frost Nixon. I, in, I interned under him. He said, Patty. Wait, he, well, he's not the star of Frost Nixon. <laughs> Michael Sheen is the star of Frost Nixon. David look, Frost is who it's about. Look, David Cross. The comedian. The star of Cross Nixon. <laughs> And also Cross Odenkirk. Right. He told me, he was like, Pat, if you got a political discussion, don't talk about it two minutes before the podcast. Put it on the podcast. Because that's, that's going to be the electric, the right. gold. Now, 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 some call it gotcha journalism. I o- don't. Oddly enough, that's what Frank Langella told me, who was also in <laughs> Frost Nixon. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, did you no, see Jack go- Frost Nixon, which was uh, <laughs> the talking snowman against Nixon in a, in a battle of wits? I saw the sequel... Where the uh, the snowman is uh, accused of uh, breaking into a hotel. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, which I liked a little bit better. Yeah. And then the beauty is they get away with it. They, they get away with the caper because the snowman melts at the end. Right. And then it turns to Watergate. There you go. Folks. That's why they... What is this, a live taping of At Midnight? <laughs> what is this, a, a comedy bo- bang bang podcast? Listen, no, these are just two guys having fun. Just to speak back to what you were saying earlier. No, that's not what I meant. It's not affecting me, so I don't care. That, that's not what I meant at all. What I meant was, I don't think anything's going to change, and then I was really wrong. Yeah, I mean... Because I, a little bit of stuff changed during Bush, but it was more like... It seemed more like P- 
panic craze, and yes. then like nothing would happen. Yeah, uh, you know, Bush was almost like a like a, a Y two K president, where you were like, it's gonna it all end, and then it didn't end, and <laughs> yeah. it and somehow felt, turned out okay. You felt like his people, diabolical fucks though they may have been, were intelligent and reasonable enough to guide him into making, granted, some some catastrophous decisions for our nation catastrophous catastrophous folks i'm not gonna lie to you pat and i <laughs> smoked a little bit of uh folks you gotta get through the goddamn day funny stuff they call you know it. wacky tobacco smoked a little of that god's green but i'm, I'm feeling fine <laughs> i just wanted to open up to you for a minute folks they, things aren't good things aren't good you know it i know it D- don't be in denial about it joe knows it joe knows it and I'll tell you, here's a little frustration of mine. Don't tweet 50 things about, folks, we must take action. We must do that. We mu-. When I can see you out my fucking back window sitting on your couch doing jack shit. Yeah. You know? Th- that's, so you're looking in people's <laughs> windows now. I purchased a telescope. I'm looking around the Silver Lake area, and I'm seeing all these tweets. Now, I'm not saying I'm on the fucking front lines either, people. And I'll take shots at Trump and I'll talk on Twitter about how helpless and scared I feel and, and try to make it amusing if I can. That's what I do. I try to bring joy here's in, in a, a time of evil. Here's what I keep saying. Yeah. Ready? Ready? The revolution will not be televised. <laughs> Unfortunately, oh. it'll be tweeted instead. Oh, uh, that's good. That I'm going to get that. should have been the title of your special, that entire <laughs> quote. <laughs> Like the bit, like you're like not even on second, the billboard. Uh, it's just those words. Who was the? Chi- uh, I almost said Avril Lavigne, Fiona Apple. Like that second album, and the tidal wave hits the pawn into the ravine. It just all it just immediately goes to her head. Yeah, second yeah, album. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna name it a paragraph. Yeah, I do love Fiona though. She's great, but I'm just saying that's that's a real that's a real dick on the table kind of move. Yeah, like uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a paragraph title. I went to see her years ago at the Greek theater by myself. I bought a ticket. I was out on a run, and I was like, yeah, that sounds like fun. I go into this thing, hundreds and hundreds of women sobbing all around me, and I'm just sitting there alone, and I, I felt guilty. I felt responsible. Did you say, hey, I thought I was out of the house this evening? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it was sort of freeing to know that that many women were crying all around me, and I was not responsible. Sure, that was sure. That's nice. Uh, the second time For I ever, once. the second time I ever appeared on television was on the Carson Daly show. Sure, I was about four years into comedy. I was scared as hell. This was after you were the uh, the bookie who beat and eventually killed Sam Malone on the series finale of Cheers. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You were not popular. You couldn't get work after that because no, everybody I, loved Sammy so much. They love Sam. I, I would and say in interviews, just, people, it's make believe. It's a show. And they said they didn't want to hear the gra- it. But the graphic violence of it to see like on the set of uh, just, you know, a familiar multicam sitcom, how, how graphic it went and then the flesh chipping away from the skull. And Pat, I got to be honest. And this might be the weed talking. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about right now. What are you talking about? I'm trying to riff. But you're, 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 you made up a thing about Cheers that wasn't a thing. So I just got stuck on there's nothing even remotely close to that in Cheers. You think oh, you'd wow. go for like a hey, more... Hey, folks, uh, we are still listening to the comedy well, section, right? Can I, I, thought I, was, the route I thought I was I working went? with a scene partner, with, with uh, a laurel to my hearty. Can I show you the route I would have went? Yeah. I would have made it a little more reality because I would have said like... Pat, after you did that gig on that movie, Happiness, now, folks, you didn't see Pat in the film. Pat's job was to stand and jerk off and, and shoot his jizz against the wall so they could get that shot. And yeah. they, they cut it in to make it look like Philip Seymour Hoffman's jizz. I was uh, the, first, the first guy in the uh, SAG, Screen Actors Guild, to be given the credit of stunt cum. See? Then you go, and after that, the guy can't get work anymore. Yeah. You you painted this whole thing. I didn't know where the hell you were going. I think I think time will tell when this drops that our listeners really enjoyed that riff that I was going on. All right. I, well, I, I, I think we're like, what will Joe say to continue this fun riff? And you immediately dismantled it, going against all rules of improv and comedy. I did not enjoy it. It was just freaking me out. It was honestly freaking me out, man. Uh, yeah. Hey, listen. I'm, I'm listening. <laughs> Here's what, L- I was look. Gonna, here's what I was going to say. Uh, 
Well, you know, I don't remember what we were talking about. Let's get on to the show. Let's talk about movies. We were talking about Trump, but we shouldn't be. No, let's, let's get us back on let's track. Let's get on to the show. It's Every- going to be a real meandering one, folks, both because we're high and we're under a great deal of stress and, and, and things are bad. But here we go with Pat's Movie Roundup. Pat's what Movie Roundup. Uh, new wise, I saw Monster Calls, where a boy's mom is dying, so he creates a fantasy world with Liam Neeson as a talking tree. And the talking tree tells him a lot of stories that have little to nothing to do with his life. I always thought that that movie was going to be about a kid first discovering masturbation. (laughs) A monster calls? (laughs) Boy, that did turn out to be a monster, didn't it? I I couldn't even count on... Why did you see this movie? Couldn't count on a thousand hands how many times I've... I pleasured myself, folks. But let's move past that. Why did you and see back to this? a monster calls? Actually, that'd be a good term for I got to take a shit. Excuse me, fellas. <laughs> a monster calls. I'm <laughs> using that. I better go answer. Doing that uh, in real life. I watched it because it was sent to us by the Academy. And if I'm going to be voting in these important elections, like our, uh, our <laughs> Writers Guild Awards, sure. I want to have seen the films. Sure. And somebody thought it was worthy of, of uh, being for my consideration. Sure. I've also seen close friends of mine talk and tweet about how much they loved it. Folks, it's, it's not a good movie. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a good movie. It's stupid. <laughs> it's like, okay, a story about a, a boy and his mom's dying. Hmm, how about we throw a talking tree into the mix? <laughs> And then the tr- the s- tree tells these stories that are like poorly animated, oh, and you watch no. like a ten minute, almost like you know that early cartoon uh, Lord of the Rings yeah, quality. I like that. And you're just watching these stories unfold, and you're like, "How? Do- what does this have to do with the kid?" And then you find out at the end, but you don't give half of the shit. I thought it was stupid. I honestly thought what it was about was this kid is like an outcast, and he gets the monster to like help him. No, the monster's Kinda there to even. help him get over his mom's death. So, what, you, I don't know. He created the monster in his mind or his emotions. Uh, oh, Christ. All right, well. Now, a similar uh, and similar uh, film is uh, Demolition, which Joe has talked about on this podcast. Jake Gyllenhaal. Jake Gyllenhaal, Naomi Watts in a in a indescribable role. What the fuck was she even doing in the movie? Her <laughs> role was so stupid she's a woman he meets on the bus she's married and she like takes him under her wing in a platonic way after his wife dies because she understands that he's damaged because she's damaged oh, and then he God. bonds with the kid and the kid starts to teach him humanity this <laughs> this movie just hit hbo folks it's so bad and joe oh, loved it and said on. it made him cry so yesterday we're texting and as i'm watching it and i was talking about how schmaltzy and like emb- honestly embarrassing the movie was and joe's like i loved it i loved it and i must have said three times admit that you were drunk while you watched it and he w- never denied it he was like of course i'd have to be drunk right i couldn't just enjoy i wasn't movie. drunk i watched it on an airplane you didn't have a couple cocktails no i don't drink when i fly i don't do that i mean i don't not do it i'm just saying i don't usually do that the the joe i know could not love demolition i, I don't understand it I'm gonna read I think the you're text. always just trying to throw a monkey in the wrench here. I'm going to read the text. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Last text of the day up to this point was at 12.10 p.m. 12.10 p.m. 7.30 p.m. Over seven hours later, walking, my dog minding my own business, I get a text from Pat. This demolition movie you recommended is just absolute shit. <laughs> As if I made it and said you have to see this. Mm-hmm. I write back, you're in a lousy mood. It's a wonderful film. Pat, you must have been on something. It's very bad. <laughs> now, I try to give him a chance here. I stand by everything I say. I try to give him a chance. I go, first off, how far into it are you? Secondly, how is it bad? I could understand you not being into it, but it's not a bad movie. Pat responds, 15 minutes remain. Now, it's hard for me to think that you got no joy out of this movie. <laughs> Until the final 15 minutes. I, I don't... I, I, it's very hard well, for no, me No, I believe. hated the final 15, too. Please don't get me wrong there. I didn't think any of it was good. I'm saying there wasn't one moment of enjoyment. There wasn't one... No, I was ext- extremely bored. You didn't find it funny when he, like, feels so little when his wife dies that he's almost, like, confused by it? No, I mean, it seemed like it was written in, like, the Sundance Lab or something, you know? All like right. In 1999... And the guy is so unlikable, and 
you just you hate him. You don't care about him. But everybody hates him. He's boring. Well, everybody in it is kind of an asshole as well. Everybody hates him in the movie. It's not like and he's I, walking I around. I still hated him at the end of the movie. But and that's what well, we're you on because then Joe was like, why can't you have a movie with with uh, bad characters? Well, no, he wrote this is Here what you wrote. Get back into it. This is what he writes. I've never given less of a shit about a lead in a movie. That's true. not true. True. That's that is not you. This isn't the worst lead character you've ever seen ever in your life in a movie. That's not true. That's an absurd. This statement. year. This year. Rich, unbelievably handsome guy can't feel. <laughs> so he breaks his expensive things. Yeah. What a tragic tale. That's not all it is. He also starts working Folks, for that. He, de- he destroys like a $3 million home, and you're sitting there watching this rich, handsome white dude destroy a $3 million home, and then you're supposed to give a shit about him T- today in 2017. I don't think it's supposed to be that you're supposed to give a shit. You're going, Certainly you're, it is. By the end, at the end, he's running down a pier in slow motion with children. You're the, supposed to come around. He's, he's at one point is laughing with a child with Down syndrome on a merry-go-round that he built to honor his dead wife. Who that, he, that's the movie we're talking who about. Who he was completely... The guy destroys his life. He throws it all away. He has no money. He spends the last of what he has in the, the, in the tale, in the climax of the movie, to put this to merry-go-round build, to build appear a merry-go-round. to honor this woman that he finally un- learned how to feel about. And, it, and the way he learned how to feel about her was destroying the life that she and her family gave him. Now, folks, just imagine Joe didn't like the movie, and he would have said exactly what he just said in a disgusted tone of voice. That's, I said that's it, what being I, I liked Sotoros it, and is. I said it in a disgusted tone. So then tone. this guy, like, because all of that was ridiculous. I said it in a disgusted tone, I like it. That's just so, how I talk. Okay, so... He learns how to feel, and then he buys a fucking merry-go-round for his fucking dead wife? That's I what wrote. That, that's what that would be if you didn't like the movie. I wrote, Pat, your cri- criticism is exactly the point of the film. You're supposed to think he's an asshole and question the way he chooses to feel, and then it all ties up in the end, which it does. Uh, Pat writes, okay, then I better pay attention. Didn't realize it all be tying up in the end. I'll probably <laughs> love it. Yeah. <laughs> Because you know how fucking Ooh. great... Man, I'm an asshole sometimes. And we're going to talk about it today. You'll stick through a goddamn Shyamalan movie till that twist comes, won't you? I sure, Especially the one we're going to talk about. And I go, the lead characters in the Bad Lieutenant movies weren't good people. I guess those movies suck too. Now Pat reneges. Now he starts backpedaling. No, not at all. My issue is not that he's a bad person. He's boring. Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole new argument. Well, no, it's not. I mean, I, I, you know I love movies about bad people and, and, and terrible people doing terrible things, but they're, they're not boring. That was, that was my issue. Uh, I, don't care, I, don't, I never care that a lead character is a bad character. I just, wh- why are we supposed to give a shit about this guy? We care about bad Santa, that first one that pops to mind, because he's a clearly a severely damaged alcoholic, you know, okay. who like never had a, a father, or never had a connection, etc. This is like, on the surface, the most privileged guy I've ever seen in my life. But he didn't earn any of it. That's the point. The oh. point is is that he married this girl well, for he all earned the wrong that reasons. Down syndrome merry go round, didn't they? Oh god. Merry go downs. I then, write when, back, when, then when he called it a merry go downs, I almost turned this thing oh, off. Come on. I wrote back I almost Pat, turned this thing off. The movie is no tremors, I'll give you that. That was a cheap yeah. shot. As I was typing uh, but what do I know? I like aliens. So we both had a oh, similar Christ. joke while loading. Yeah. Uh, by the way, James Cameron, who uh, just did an interview that said, I don't think we need another alien movie. They've kind of gone off base as he plans to reboot the Terminator again next year. You're not going to be first in line for what? You're not going to go see the new Terminator. Yeah, of course, I'll go see it. Are- this guy's this guy's sitting there going, you know, I don't think we need a new alien movie. The The franchise has gone a bit off track. This is what he says in the in the <laughs> interview that he that he. Then he tries to do a save all by going, don't get me wrong, I'd it watch has, any Ridley Scott movie. Yeah, but like you don't think that these other Terminator movies have been bad. You love three and, and f- I think four and five. My point is, is the thing that everybody yells about James Cameron being so great for, oh, he made the good two movies and whatever. Yeah. Then he comes out and he shits on a different, a competing franchise and says it's gone off the rails as if the whole world doesn't <laughs> think his franchise has gone off the rails and he's rebooting it again <laughs> next year. It was just a snotty thing. All I just, right. That's all. All right. Um, all right. Well, I tell you what. 
anyone who's making Avatar four right now doesn't really need to flap his mouth. That's about, what I'm uh, saying. Unwanted sequels. That's what I'm saying. This goes on and on. I'll I just read. You, I, I caught 20 minutes of True Lies the other night. I was pumping my goddamn fist. I was I was standing up pumping my fist. Hate the film. True Lies is a is a great movie. It's not a great movie, Pat. It's not a good. This is why I, nobody can trust you on your demolition so you, opinion. You say demolition is a better movie. I'm not talking hundred de- percent. No, I'm not talking demolition man, Joe. I'm talking That's demolition. A hundred percent. You think Demolition is a better movie than I'll put True Demolition Lies? Demolition Man over True Lies, and oh. Demolition Man's a shitty movie, but at least it's got a cool uh, uh, statement to it. You make your own arguments. At least it's got an interesting like, statement. I don't. I mean, I, I don't have to make them. You, you, you make my arguments for me. All right, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just what you say. jump to some of the uh, highlights, remaining highlights. This movie packs all the power of a jewelry commercial. <laughs> that was from Pat. Yeah, I said that. Uh, <laughs> Man, I'm funny. Uh, you know what I mean. Uh, I said my keen and learned palate for the cinema is never wrong. You're wrong. He didn't reply. And that was the end of that. Yeah. And then I said I'm going to eat weed by myself. I never did that before. Any pointers? And he sent me a bunch of mocking memes. <laughs> they all they all were Samuel L. Jackson saying, "Hold on to your butt." No help. Now. Point. Now, here's the end part to the story, because I know a lot of you were sitting there going, ooh, Walsh had the last laugh. Always. Walsh had the last laugh in that one. No, your old buddy Joe did. Because later that night, I went over to my friend Vince's house. Now, what the fuck's going on now? Pat wouldn't join us because you're sitting in, you were staying in yesterday, right? Yeah. I wanted to stay in and watch movies, which I yeah, did all yeah. day. And you were a little stressed, right? Yeah. You know, you know, a little stressed about yeah. some work-related stuff. Some right? projects in the pipeline. Yeah. But you were stressed. Couple no cats in the cradle. And you made it very clear that the, the stress was you didn't feel like doing anything. You wanted to stay home because you, were, you, were, you weren't feeling great. <laughs> right. I go over to Vince's, uh, Averill's, our dear friend. I don't know, about 10 o'clock at night. We're listening to a Spotify. He follows you on Spat- Spotify. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't know this. He was apparently tracking you. Uh, I'm what, sitting in Vince's chair. All of a sudden, he's up there putting a song on. All of a sudden, this is the song that comes on. That May song. <laughs> bad boys. Bad, 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 yeah, that's bad, right. Bad. That comes on. I go, Vince, what the fuck, man? <laughs> and he goes, he goes, uh, I mean, I just put this on because Patty Walsh is listening to it. Our boy Patty Walsh is listening to Mace. Wow. Uh, wherever he is right now. And I this go. Is, this is like, it's like a uh, a prank show today's episode. And I go, Wal- I go, I go, Walsh is listening to me. I go, he told me he was too stressed and depressed to leave the house today. This is what he's listening to? Yeah, to cheer up. <laughs> to cheer up. I'll this throw is, on a little Mace. This is his depression music. No, and, I, and I was Vince. I, I decided to cheer myself up and put on some fucking Mace. Vince Averill turned. And with with all the with all the concern of a parent that finds hypodermic needles in their son's sock drawer, goes, he's listening to this to get himself through. <laughs> he's right on the money. He's right on the money. <laughs> and we both, I think, were a little afraid for for your well being. No, no, no. I mean, I I'm, I'm afraid for the world. I got a big heart. When I see what's going on, folks, it, it bums me out. I had a bad day yesterday. All right, look. Well, here we are today, right? Is that all right? Does that feel good that you're here with me? Feels good, Joe. At I also watched The Accused yesterday <laughs> to talk a little more about my mood. Uh, Why would you watch that when you felt the way you did? Because I didn't know if I had ever seen it. I know, you know, it's like a very off-color joke in Wedding Crashers about I knew Jodie Foster got raped on a uh, pinball machine. That's all I really knew. But then it started, and I was like, I've never seen this. So I watched it. Thought it was fantastic. It was made thirty years ago, and it's like it's about like was she asking for it? Like it's a very timely thing. Of course, she was not asking for it, folks. Uh, I'm not, not going to hit you with that twist. And then there's the actual trial is about all these guys cheering on the gang rape. So the trial that she goes to is not to put her rapists away. It's to put away the guys who cheered it on and enabled it and didn't stop it. And what did they do with the rapists? The rapists go away for like three years. Like they get a, like a plea bargain, and they're already in jail. 
But I was like, this is like such a more complex movie than I was expecting. And guys, I, I mean, it's a tough watch. But if you haven't seen The Accused, it's an amazing fucking movie that I re- that you, maybe you think you've seen, but you haven't. Jodie Foster, yet bef- uh, pre-Silence of the Lambs, Jodie Foster. Kelly McGillis, post-Top Gun Kelly McGillis. Two women who would later become lesbians. Maybe they uh, found love on the set of the film. I don't know. I don't want to tell Wait, tales to, out of school. Uh, lovers they became? No, but they're they're currently both lesbians and good for them. Oh, that is right. Kelly McGillis did, did marry a yeah. woman, I believe. But, uh, man, it was just such a fucking great movie that I found myself like watching the extras. Uh, you know, I was just like very uh, interested in everything about it. It's based on a true story. Uh, but then again, I remembered it as opening with the rape and it being kind of graphic but shown very briefly and tastefully. But sure enough, you watch like an hour 40 of this movie and they just show you the entire 10 minute gang rape sequence, like in the middle of this courtroom drama, how it happened. And it's very, very, very traumatic. And uh, yeah, it sounds like a horrible thing to watch. I mean, I, I, I mean, it for was. awareness, it seems like a good thing. Yeah, but, I knew uh, it was depressing. I was not aware that I was going to watch like this, like intense and graphic of a scene. And then. I st- on these extra features, he was ta- this guy who did Unlawful Entry and a couple other great thrillers of the uh, 80s and 90s. But he was just saying that they showed a cut. Wait, to- you, the special features? Were you by the DVD? I had it. Accused? It was on a yeah, like a four pack that I had. All right. Courtroom dramas or something. So the guys like it was uh, the the four pack was the accused deliverance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> I I searched that word, but um. Yeah, he was talking about how they showed a cut to, like, Paramount or whatever, and it got the lowest scores in the history of it, and most of the people on their comment cards said that she deserved to be raped. Jesus, really? So, like, because she dances pretty provocatively in this bar for about three minutes, and her her, sli- her uh, tank top things are kind of falling off and showing a little breast, perhaps. That was right when that whole argument started. Yeah. Where people were like, it doesn't matter whatever the woman was doing, you you're not allowed to just have sex with her. Right, of course. Force. And like that almost seemed to be the argument of the people in the movie, but it's I tell you the most chilling thing about it was that it sh- it showed absolutely no forward movement to now from 1988. There was like no d- it, this movie really? would have been made today, they wouldn't have had to update a single thing about it and that was 30 years ago, which is disturbing. But uh, it was a, I, I got to say, it's a very fascinating movie if you can, if you can put up with that 10 minutes. I'm surprised they haven't made a movie like that recently because it's certainly yeah. I mean, uh, a very, very talked about issue in the media and whatnot. And, and yeah. you'd, think, you'd think that something, and I, then I wonder, are these studios so fucking, so fucking white bread that they won't let a movie like that get made because it's too graphic? Probably. I mean, that. Everything I've been hearing is that any movie twenty million dollars and under can get made if it's an independent type movie, and anything like seventy five and over can get made. But that sweet spot of between twenty and seventy five is where like all of your favorite movies from the eighties and nineties come from. Mm-hmm. They just don't make them anymore because they don't feel they're worth the risk to spend fifty million dollars on like an adult drama and make fifty two million dollars. It's not worth it to them, and they don't do anything overseas. Because there's no monsters and shit in them. So well, that's what happens. And that's how you wind up with Office Christmas Party. Didn't see it. I'm not going to speak out against it. Uh, I didn't see it either. Uh, I don't want to see it. I was rooting for it. I, I like an R-rated comedy. They're, they're rare. It's the laziest title <laughs> next to Hotel for Dogs. It's the laziest title I've ever yeah. heard a movie ever have. How about Titanic? No, that's fine. You know, if it's a, butter, it's a historical thing... Biographical thing, fine. Malcolm X, fine. Titanic, fine. Selma, fine. <laughs> Named after a person or a location or right. something. You know what I mean? That that that's fine. If it's some kind of even look, Fargo, great name. Sure, great name. But if uh, the Office Christmas Party people had named it, it would have been called Lady Cop on the Hunt. <laughs> <laughs> you telling me you wouldn't go see Lady Cop on the Hunt? I would, but that's yeah. besides the point. Yeah. <clears throat> um. All right, let's move on to Joe's scary stuff. <laughs> what are you on about? I support your little fucking things you do every week. It was the, it was the way you delivered that intro. That That's uh, why I did it, though. No, I, I loved it. It's a marker. I want to hear it again, but I laughed at it. It brought me joy. Well, you joy. said, ugh. 
is the part that upset me. Yeah, it was gross, and yet I loved it. Okay, all right. The uh, Joe Scare this week, I would like to uh, send a shout out, and these are not these people are not sponsoring us, by the way. This is this is not a sponsored product segment, or at least it's not yet. Uh, and we're not doing it for that reason. We're just doing a segment where we can talk about some stuff that is horror-related uh, that, that is not a film uh, because there are a lot of cool products out there for horror fans. Uh, and the product I want to talk about this week is Horror Pack. Uh, if you haven't heard of this, go to horrorpack.com. Uh, they have two subscriptions. One is $20 a month. One is $25 a month. $20 a month subscription is DVD. 25 is Blu-ray. And here's what you get. Every single month, they send you four brand new movies of the horror genre on whichever uh, media you've chosen your plan to be for, and you keep them forever. That's it. That's it. And it's a big surprise grab bag every month. Gotten some great stuff. You get a couple real indie flicks, but everything in there is something they clearly uh, stand behind. Are we getting behind. paid for this? Huh? Are we getting paid for this? No. Well, what? I said I wanted to talk about a, a horror-related product that people should check out. All right. So, I mean, it, it's basically, uh, it just sounds like an ad. Well, remember last time I, I talked about Resident Evil 4? Yeah, no, I don't. I just <laughs> think people should do this thing. I don't All want right. it to go away. Right, right. Look, we, we can ask them to sponsor us. Yeah, we should. That's sort of, I guess, what we could use this part for. Yeah. But that's not why I'm doing it. All right. Uh, well, well, look how committed we are to you. Now will you yeah. cough up some goddamn money? My point is, you like horror movies. You cowards. Should... You cowards. <laughs> well, don't insult them. My, you, you like horror movies, you got to do this thing. I've gotten some really cool flicks. Uh, Great. Yeah. Any big titles, or are you just getting old shit? Uh, you get both. I got the collector's edition of Hannibal and the Tin Case the other day. Oh. I got the Fog, or the Carpenter version, which is the one you want. You open it, Fog comes out of the box. Thought yeah. that was a cool uh, you know, feature. I've gotten a bunch of really cool stuff, man. A really, house one and house two, the the dual pack. All right. Uh, one sure time, talking. one time, one of the movies was a box set of old like seventies exploitation horror movies and that was seven things in like a metal coffin and that only counted as one of the movies because it was a it was a package deal so you get a lot of those kinds of things too really really cool man folks it sounds like a great deal it's an amazing deal uh joe, never, joe, joe and i are dear friends did never told me about it i've and definitely told you about this talk about it on the podcast i've told you about this and you and you met it with the same pig fucking nosed disgusting ignorance that you met the movie demolition <laughs> with so oh, you've God. missed out folks we've already gotten some comments about how bad demolition is like on previous episode when joe raved about it but please watch the movie on hbo and send in your comments one more scary love to hear what you think one more thing for joe scary stuff Ooh. i just want to point this out because i got it today made it 10 times better with a howl if, it, we, had, I if we had discussed it, yeah. it i would have thrown in the howl earlier do the howl every week from now on i went to francis howl high school is where i went to high school Really? Mrs. Howell. The, uh, anyway. I once, on. I once had sex with a Mrs. Howell. And then uh, she fell off the face of the earth. It's like she went to some remote island or something. Never heard from Holy her ever again. Cow. <laughs> Holy cow. Holy uh, cow. <clears throat> There's a time where today, Joe said yes and, and he maybe should have said no but, folks. I went to an antique store today to buy a lamp. Uh, I needed an, another lamp. Uh, for my living room, and uh, while I was there, I just look on the wall, and they got a French version of the Ch Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 poster. It's the large official, you know, like movie theater poster, the giant one. It's an actual print from one of the original prints from the 80s when the movie came out, and it's in French, and I bought it, and now it's hanging next to my TV. Looks great. I'm very excited about it. That's all I got, Pat. You want to get into this movie? Well, let me do mine real quick. Oh. Uh, Beware the Slender Man, brand new documentary on HBO. It's a movie, Pat. But it's not It's not a horror movie. It's a documentary, and you might not think about it in that way. Well, but it's a, all right. I mean, I think, you know. I thought you. I thought it was non-horror was the theme. It was it. like a, uh, no, it's like a horror-related product. We're not reviewing a movie. You're saying I'm like, sorry. hey, there's this new book out that's a collection of Just anthologies. Just you're getting your palms greased on the side by... Uh, HorrorDVDPack.com. 
doesn't mean I can't recommend a fine film. Beware the Slender Man, watch it. Let's get on to our uh, task at hand, which is the new M. Night Shyamalan. Let me just say something. Sh- Sh- Had you said the Slender Man, meaning you were going to talk about maybe befriending the actual Slender Man, that would have counted. No. But I- not a movie about it. Sorry, I just don't understand what your shitty theme segment is. It's yet. a product that's horror related that's not a movie. It's not that hard to understand. Right. Hey, I bought a, an action figure of Freddy Krueger by this toy maker. It's pretty cool. Check it out. There, there you go. How about uh, I got an electric bill last week that was pretty scary. Yeah, th- <laughs> that's better than what you did. <laughs> All right, this week's Ugh. movie, Split. Ooh. Split by M. Night Ooh. Shyamalan. Split, which I earlier called Switch by M. Night Shyamalan. <laughs> and uh, Joe and I went to see it this week. A rare, uh, a too rare, if I may say, my dear friend Joe, together movie that we saw. We went, we had a drink over at the old Cheesecake Factory. Oh, yeah. Glendale Americana. And then we sidled on. Joe actually took a couple of apps with him to go and brought him into the theater, which was surely a violation of, of their policy. Right, right. And then we watched uh, Switch, Split. Joe's eating like uh, wings, dipping them in blue cheese next to me in the dark. It was very sensual. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, the I was kind of into the movie and Give Joe the turns synopsis. to me. Well, hold on a second. Right. Give the synopsis of the movie the first. Syn- uh, the synopsis is there's uh, three girls leaving a birthday party. They're about 15, 16 years old. Um, and they're with their father. And this maniac kills their father, kidnaps the three girls, and takes them to his underground lair. There they realize he has... 23 and perhaps 24 personalities and it's kind of a serial killer type movie after that where they're held his prisoner yes and uh i was enjoying it if not like in love with it and i'm kind of going along with it and joe turns me and he's like this is a piece of shit right isn't this fucking terrible and i was like i wouldn't go that far and it kind of kept growing on me there i had big problems with it and yet I liked it quite a bit. I loved the beginning. I was super invested. Yeah. I came back around to it at the end uh, for reasons w- that we can talk about later, but with a huge spoiler alert. Yeah, we'll, we'll set that aside if we're going to talk serious spoilers about split. The end brought me back to it and made me like it as a whole. Yeah. Uh, but the middle, when I didn't know where it was going and kind of just had an idea of where it was going, I... Uh, I thought was overstuffed, overdrawn. Sure. It took way too long. I didn't need flashback. The, the the flashback of all right. Now we're getting into spoiler territory. So if you don't want to know, you you should switch the the dial. Are we going to talk about her as a young girl and the the yeah, hunting story? Yeah, it's like this. There's this dumb hunting story thing with the flashbacks of the girl, and then it's that her uncle molested her and yeah. did molest her, and which which was disturbing and like okay fine i it's it's a reality and like i i I can deal with a disturbing reality like that but it had no real place in the movie i didn't see it like why it had to do with it these women were in a horrifying situation already and then they're on top of it they're like oh and then this girl's backstory is also horrible and you're like okay well what's the point of that and then you realize at the end of the movie it's to do that goddamn thing that Shyamalan does in every movie which is in the flashback, she pulled a gun, a shotgun, on her uncle uh, to finally get him to back away from her and stop molesting her. And then in the end of the movie, when she's in this climactic uh, situation uh, with, with this maniac, she, he just so happens to have the same sh- type of shotgun that she has to then use to defend herself. And it's like... It doesn't have to all be that neat of a bow, man. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I honestly, until you were saying it just now, because this was the one aspect of the movie I really hated for a variety of reasons. But her grabbing that shotgun was, of course, supposed to be like her taking a second chance at killing an, an, uh, a sexual abuser. Correct? Sure. Yeah. You know, that's, that's I guess what we're I, supposed to take from it. I think that's exactly what it's supposed to be. But sometimes... She didn't shoot him the first time. She lived with him. And now when she goes back, then... So, like, is, the, is it worth it there? Like, w- when she rounded that tent and he's, you know, it's this big gross dude and he's in his underwear, like he's going to be play, play barn animals with her or whatever. 
Like, is it worth that imagery and conjuring up this adorable girl who, like, was, like, such a great actress? I really liked that young actress. And her as an adult I liked as well. I thought they were both really good. That's the girl from The Witch, by the way. I know. But uh, just to, to, to put her through that, like, why... Why is that necessary in your movie to make her grabbing a gun at the end more satisfying? Because it didn't. It, well, made, that, it, but it made it my, all feel gross. To that's me. my point is that Shyamalan does this thing where everything has to be connected and yeah. sometimes it's stupid. Y- you could have easily just... Like swing away and, and signs. Exactly. Swing yeah. away and signs. The fucking kid doing the football charge at the end right. of the visit. Right. It's every goddamn thing. Now, here's the thing. The kid rapping in the fucking visit was a goddamn tragedy even though i love the visit you could have he could have easily achieved the same type of uh you know commentary or sentiment whatever you want to call it if he it, without it being exact they could have insinuated yeah. that she had a checkered past and that her uncle was probably abusive to her or whatever and then she could have still stood up to the bad guy in this and and at the end of the movie and and you would have been like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Like she's. I mean, she's, let me let me throw this at you off the top of my head. Let's he just say, makes it identical, though, and it's stupid. Yeah. Let's say the whole molestation, molestation uh, sub story doesn't happen. He picks her up at the end. This uncle who we met earlier in the movie, like a breakfast club type deal. He comes to pick her up and he's like, uh, where the fuck were you? You scared me and raises his hand, hand, hand up, hand up, up to her. And then she gets out of the car, and she's like, no, I have to deal with one abuser. I'm not going to do this anymore, or something. It's off the top of my head. That probably would have felt stupid, too. I'm saying I don't think we need to see a, not graphic in terms of we're seeing anything, but just pretty graphic depiction of molestation that the movie doesn't support. Well, it's then, using it as like a little side story. Then at the end of the movie, she's in, she's in the custody of the authorities now because, you know, she's escaped, and they're they're waiting to to hand her off to her uh, guardians. And she's in the back seat of this like cop car, completely traumatized for obvious reasons. And then the door opens and the co- this female cop goes, uh, hey, your uncle's here. It's time to go home, sweetie. And then you're like, for Christ's sakes, man, like I've seen her go through enough. Now, now it's like, oh, she's definitely not 18. Yeah. And she definitely has to go because they never really say their age. Oh, but I see. I actually thought in that moment she locked eyes with that police officer, and she was going to tell her about her. Oh, okay. Problem. Well, then maybe that is what will happen. But it it was maybe too subtle. But that police officer was like looking at her like, "You mean you don't want to get back together with your uncle?" And then they All shared right. this look like she was going to tell the whole story. All right, then I'll let that go. That's fine. Um, so Just, it's an odd thing to use. It's like uh, you know how every tv series for the past twenty years, when ratings are getting low, will have a main character get raped. It starts to feel a little unnecessary and strange to me and if you're using it for shock value that feels a little weird i will say uh it's so so okay so then my other thing was but again these are the the bookends of this film i thought were great so the middle of the movie is predominantly james mcavoy who plays the uh multiple who was personality great. guy he's let's awesome. be real he everybody's was great, great in the fucking movie everybody's great in it yeah uh yeah, it's, it's, it's his. The, it's the best friend from uh, Edge of Seventeen, which I loved, is one of the girls, and I did not recognize the third girl. But they were all really great in the movie. So the bulk of the middle of this movie is James McAvoy going to therapy. Yeah, and that's when I turned to you and I was like, "All right, this sucks." Like there were like five fucking scenes of him in therapy, and they were long. And it's like, "Hey guys, I didn't come here to listen to people talk about multiple personality disorder. This is fucking boring." Yeah, we get it. We get it. And I don't need, again, I don't need all these things so spelled out for me. You're telling me that some of the personalities could actually manifest things that others weren't capable of? Yeah. They, it's almost like it says in the script, in bold, make sure you really put some stink on this because this is the big, this is going to foreshadow a, a plot twist. Yeah, I now, mean, well, when, when that finale comes around, I was kind of like, uh, if this was like a, a truly surprising thing and it was hinted at throughout, it would have been much cooler than... Everyone just almost looking you in the camera and saying, "This will happen later." That's which is, what I'm which saying. Is what happened? Yeah, it's like uh, yeah, you're I'm watching. Agreeing. It's it's like you're watching. It's Gary Shandling show, and he's yeah. just turning the camera and yeah, telling yeah. you everything what's happening. So that was the part where I turned to Pat. And I was like, "This, this is getting annoying. I don't, I'm not enjoying this." And then, right at the very end, and this is where it started to come around again for me. 
I turn to you. I don't even remember me saying this. They keep hinting through the whole movie the 24th personality is coming. Right. The beast. The beast. I turn to you. I go, a fucking werewolf or something better show up at the end of this goddamn thing because I was like, there's no way this is going to get supernatural on us. And then, again, spoiler alert. Here we go. It gets supernatural. Yeah. He does. And that was all pretty cool. Yeah. He's able to like he becomes this personality. He's able to climb walls. He d- he's able to deflect shotgun bullets when she shoots him, um, and he ends up escaping. And it's a bit of a head scratcher, but you're like, okay, that was pretty wild. And I haven't seen a Shyamalan twist that wild in a long time. Yep. I'm paying attention. I'm paying attention. Now here's the big spoiler, and this is this is where I was like, I'm a hundred percent in. Holy I actually shit. grabbed Joe's knee like a like a young girl, <laughs> a young, so, beautiful girl. The last scene is a news report on a TV set in a diner. The reporter is saying, you know, this this suspect has escaped. We don't know where he is, but because of all of his personalities, there being 24 in total, he's be, he's been nicknamed the Horde. And cool, cool nickname, by the way. And I go and I'm sitting there to myself going. This is this is getting dumb. Like, what is happening right now? And then the camera goes into the diner, pan, or, uh, pans down the, uh, the the countertop area where people are sitting. A lady goes, the horde. That's crazy. That's kind of like that guy that was nuts in the wheelchair that they put away. What did they call him? And then I was like, holy shit. Yep. Holy shit. Yep. And then the reveal of Bruce Willis. I just got chills saying it right now. The reveal of Bruce Willis sitting there and he goes, they called him Mr. Glass. And then he does that Bruce Willis face for a good 30 <laughs> seconds that he makes at John Travolta in yeah. uh, Pulp Fiction. Yeah. Um, I, just I, got I bolted up in my seat. I, and I, I hadn't been that excited about anything in a long time. And in that, I hate, we, I, we told you spoiler alert twice because I would have hated to have that ruined. I didn't know what was coming at the end of it and I fucking loved it. If you're an Unbreakable fan. But in that one moment. When I'm moment, looking around at the 12-year-old kids in the audience, do they even know what that meant? Maybe not. I don't well, know. here's the thing. Tell me In that thing. one moment, that's when I went, this is a great movie. Yeah. Because everything I questioned, again, you know, I had my little you know, problems. I don't put such a stink on this line, and I don't need this tied into that or whatever. But aside from that stuff, that moment was when I was like, I really like this movie a lot because I was not expecting that surprise. Fans of Unbreakable have been waiting for Unbreakable 2 forever. Oh, and then I would have loved it 10 years ago. All you had to do was see Bruce Willis's face, and then everything that was kind of crazy in the movie, like, wait, he deflected bullets? What? Yeah. Like, all of a sudden, you were like, holy shit, this is the Unbreakable universe. He's a fucking another supervillain that Bruce Willis is going to have to fight. Yeah. And, uh, and, it, and then it suddenly it was like, oh, this is so fucking cool. Yeah, and then I read... It was probably BuzzFeed or some... I hate to give them traffic for all the bad that they do, including just outright stealing some of my jokes and posting them as their own, which they've been <laughs> called out about in the past by myself. But uh, <laughs> anyway, it was some sort of article about um, interviewing Shyamalan about the twist and about what it means for Unbreakable 2 and all that. And he had the best answers for it. He was like, I, ju- I, I had that version, and I was like, right down to the last minute, not going to use the Bruce Willis thing. Right. He was like, I just kind of wanted to do it, and I thought it would be a cool thing to let the audience know, like, the whole time you've been watching a movie that's in a franchise that you didn't even realize it was in, which is kind of amazing that he pulled it off, and amazing that no one ever thought to do it before. That's I think that, that twist made it a great movie, and to know that that was his goal was very cool to me, and it sets up a great thing for Unbreakable too. Also, as I told Joe, the Horde was in the original Unbreakable script, and I think producers very wisely said you should just focus on one, Mr. Glass, because I don't right. think you can't introduce the whole superhero thing and do a twist and have him fight a bunch of people. It's not going to work. Right. But it makes me very excited about Unbreakable 2. I hope he gets some money, though, because his last two movies have cost $5 million bucks. I don't really want to see a $5 million Unbreakable 2. Well, you know, look, man, I, I, I just want to see an Unbreakable 2. And I, I felt like this movie... I felt like the visit with Shyamalan inching closer back to his territory. I felt like this movie, he really jumped back in the saddle. It's, yeah. uh, it's a great flick. Despite my criticisms in the big picture of the film, they're, they're small. Yeah, and I and, love and that his... the guy had the balls to just... He basically did... A, just like he did with Unbreakable, where at the end he's like, 
I got you. I just made you watch a comic book and you didn't even know it. Right. I love that he wrote a sequel to the comic book and just did it. And the fact that people, uh, you're right, there would be people going, what the fuck are they, are they talking about? Yeah. He was well, like, that's yeah, why he, he kind of wisely put it after the first credit, like, that maybe you'd just be like, oh, I guess that was a weird Bruce Willis cameo and not right. a part of the movie. But um, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I and, look and forward. He's lurching, like, he, he really does, like, sometimes you're like, what the fuck is this? What are you doing? Why am I following this when I should be following this? And I think that's. When I look back at his movies, it's always what I like about them is that they are kind of all over the place. It's kind of makes you um, a little more uneasy, I guess, which I like. Yeah. So uh, that that sounds like a that sounds like a two approval, Pat. We agree. Yes. Go see Split. You'll two enjoy. Thumbs it. up for Snitch. In fact, well, if you listen to this much and you haven't seen it yet, it's ruined. Don't see it. But <laughs> well, we uh, told you. We we we, 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 we warned you. For the tail end of the show, folks, let's do deep cuts. Deep cuts. I've already forgotten this one. Well, Pat, it's because I do all the work. You talking about an old favorite? No, deep cuts is when I read the short, insulting thing off of Rotten oh. Tomatoes about a movie well, that, that looks shitty. Oh, because it cuts deep. Now I get it. Yeah. It didn't. I wouldn't have thought that that well, segment was called that. That's what it's called. It's a weird title. Go I've ahead. told you that that's <sighs> deep cuts. <laughs> Uh, this is the, for the movie Sleepless. What's, oh, with Jamie Foxx? The new Jamie Foxx vehicle. Yeah. You know, I've never seen a plot like this before. Guy doesn't want to get his hands dirty. Daughter gets kidnapped. He kills everybody. It's, this is a it's new. It's very fresh. <laughs> yes. Uh, this comes from uh, David Ehrlich at IndieWire. I like David Ehrlich. The listless, shoddy sort of a remake where it feels like all of the characters have already seen the movie they're in. Sleepless reduces one of the best action films of the 21st century into one of the most benign. Whew. And I'd like to read Whew. one as well, folks. This what is one, it a remake of, by the way? Uh, I don't know. I don't know anything about that movie at all. All right. Well, there you, there's your there's your deep cut. I want to read one from uh, Dustin on Film File. It says, Demolition would be so twee it hurts if it weren't equally spiteful and disingenuous. Well, sounds like he's describing you. Oh, jeez. Folks, here are the plugs. I'm rubber, you're glue. That's what, that's what we're coming back with? <laughs> that's what we're coming back with, folks? It wasn't. No, because the Demolition movie didn't say that. I said it. You weren't insulting me. Listen. Here's the thing. Don't watch Demolition. But you should watch Demolition Man. It's got a brilliant commentary. It's you about know, you, you should watch his Dead Ringers. I watched that last night. Dead Ringers is fucking great. Very yeah. unsettling. Yeah, Jeremy Irons, Cronenberg. Very unsettling. I mean, to me, the the you know, the, the biggest creep show in cinematic history is Jeremy Irons. I mean, it was uh, Cronenberg teaming up with Goldblum. I mean, oh, you yeah. couldn't you no. couldn't get two creepier guys in a room You almost together. can't shower those <laughs> 80s period uh, Cronenbergs off your skin after you watch them. They're rough. And he follows it with Peter Weller with yeah. that naked lunch thing that's yeah. bad shit and doesn't follow the book, but it, yep. I don't know what the fuck is going on in that movie. I'm a fan, though. Anyway, uh, my... Uh, it, it, it's out now. Go watch my hour special for Comedy Central. You let me down. Yeah. Well, we don't uh, know because this will this will this will not drop before your show airs. So don't say. It's well, my show now. airs. Uh, yeah, it aired February. Th oh no, this might. Yeah, February third. Absolutely air. Oh before. shit, I forgot. Okay, February third at midnight. My special premieres. You let me down on Comedy Central. It's an hour. I wrote it. I directed it. I do the stand up. Please go watch it. Uh, and if you don't watch it, you'll let us down. Yes. Uh, February right. 5th is the replay, 1 a.m. playing off the tongue. February 7th, and it's the internet for download. Uh, so check it out. Follow me, Joe DeRosa Comedy, on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, that's where you can see where I'm playing live stuff. I am on Twitter and Instagram at the Patrick Walsh. Uh, in addition to that, a show that I... Uh, Helped uh, write and produce, and Joe wrote for as well, is our friend Pete Holmes' new show, Crashing, which starts airing on HBO in a couple weeks, I believe, early February after the season premiere of Girls. Check it out. Support, support, good shit. It's a funny show. 
You've been listening to We'll See You in Hell, which is a presentation of the Fangoria Podcast Network. It was produced by Thomas DeFeo and executive produced by the great Ken Hanley of Fangoria Entertainment. For press opportunities, advertising inquiries, and information about We'll See You in Hell, contact Ken at Fangoria.com. You can reach me at the Patrick Walsh, Joe at Joe DeRosa Comedy. We read and see and love all of your uh, comments, tweets, etc. about the show. We also have a new Facebook page. Let me very quickly shout this girl out who set it up. And we will probably get our own official one going shortly. But I wanted to direct you to this and I almost forgot. Um, her name is Emily Florence. She has set up a Facebook group for fans of We'll See You in Hell. I checked that out the other day. It is awesome. Going to start spending some more time in there. Thanks, Emily. Uh, thank you very much, Emily. And uh, go check out that group. Guys, we love you. Appreciate it. Talk soon.